we start to go like, are my kids really solid in anything yet? Or is this method producing anything yet? And you kind of want to see like, how is this going to develop as they get older? And I hadn't seen much of it yet. Hey guys, so today is a chit chat. I wanted to talk about something that has been exciting to me um, in our homeschool this year specifically. And it was something that I was starting to get a little discouraged about, but I, you know, it's just trusting the process. And I'm starting to see some things that are making me really excited. Um, and so I just wanted to have a little chit chat with you guys, share what some of those things have been for us, and then see if it provokes any thoughts from you guys about similar happenings in your homeschool. So let's get started. So um, we have always kind of aligned with the Charlotte Mason method. I wouldn't say that I sought out the Charlotte Mason method and then started trying to change our homeschool to fit it. What happened for us was um, I had heard of it. I had done a little bit of research about it. I had also researched other methods, but I was kind of not committed to anything. Um, and as I researched more and more or heard more or was watching some of Sonia Schaefer's videos or listening to, um, you know, different podcasts, I started to realize that not, it, it was less of us trying to conform to a method and more of realizing that that method fit my goals and kind of the direction we were already heading. And so because I felt like it was a good fit for our family versus just trying to fit our family into it. Um, we started aligning more and more with that method as time went on, which you guys know. I kind of make a little bit of changes, a, a few changes every year in our homeschool, just minor tweaks or pick up more subjects or replace more subjects to fit that method, but it's never been like a cold turkey thing for us. That doesn't generally work well in anything that we do. Um, and I loved it, you know, and, and this year has been really fun because the, the thing that we kind of took on this year was more of the artist, composer, those type of studies. Um, although we did do a little bit more of those last year and we've done those every year, but that, that's been our, more of our focus this year. So one year, um, we focused more on just reading living books and then we've carried that on. One year we started focusing more on the habit training side of things and now that's carried through our homeschool. Um, so every year I add in a little bit more. And when my daughter was almost in third grade, well, when she was in third grade is when I made the biggest leap of faith um, as far as the Charlotte Mason method goes and that was choosing to use the Simply Charlotte Mason Using Language Well and Spelling Wisdom program because that is so different than other reading, writing, and spelling curriculums that we had used um, or that I've seen out there. So I knew that I was trusting the process at that point and no longer um, going to be seeing grade level type of results. Um, and I just, I do trust that in the future, you know, I'll see the fruit of that, but it was a big leap of faith for me in third grade because the first book, the third and fourth grade levels, you definitely feel, um, like, okay, this feels way behind. But the whole point of that is that you only teach your children certain things as far as spelling and reading and grammar and all that once when they're old enough to remember it. So for example, like I learned nouns, pronouns, adverbs, adjectives, all of that multiple times in elementary school. And I don't even think that stuck with me until middle school, if it even did, because by the time that I was hearing it every year, I was like glazed over, but I never really had a firm grasp on it. Now my daughter is being taught that once and she's got a very firm grasp on it. So in, in, in other words, I'm just saying that choosing to make that leap of faith was a big commitment for me because I knew that if we wanted to back out of that curriculum a few years down the road, we were gonna be way off and not no longer aligned with other grade level type curriculum. And so I just said, you know what? I've trusted enough of this process so far, I'm going to commit to this and we're just going to, without a safety net, trust that by the time they're in high school, um, you know, they will have received a full writing, spelling, grammar, education through, through that and other things. Um, but you know, last year, um, or starting beginning of this year, so she's in fifth grade now, 
I was starting not to question necessarily that decision, but I was starting to reevaluate the method we've chosen as a whole because as, and it's just inevitable that you do this in homeschool, you watch other people's kids. And so I have friends whose kids are in classical conversations. I have friends whose kids are super, super good at, you know, some um, uh, coding and things like that. And you start to go like, are my kids really solid in anything yet? Or is this method producing anything yet? And you kind of want to see like, how is this going to develop as they get older? And I hadn't seen much of it yet until one day Jesse noticed something and that opened my mind to seeing, you know, how my kids, how this rich educational experience was manifesting in my kids. And now I'm totally obsessed with the, you know, the method as a whole. So I wanted to share what those few little moments were. Each of my kids have done one thing in the last few months. Um, I mean, they've done multiple things that have really shown me that this whole method is sticking with them and is good for our family. Um, but they've each done one thing that's really stood out to me and I've made a mental note. I've wanted to make this video for a while not to convince anyone to do the Charlotte Mason method because, you know, like I said, I just, I felt like our family was already aligned with that, ver you know, versus the opposite. Um, but to encourage you guys um, through my story of a couple of things that my kids have done to maybe notice that you're not doing as bad of a job as you may think you're doing as well, like I, like I did. The comparison is a thief of joy, we all know that, but we are doing it whether we realize it or not. So I wanted to share a couple of little stories and then I want you guys to share a couple of stories in the comments below about, you know, um, say your kids are in CC or you're, you use the Waldorf method or any of those, like what specific things have your kids done that have really grounded you and um, made you commit to that method or what fruits have you seen of that? Also, um, maybe it's just a curriculum if you don't adhere to it you know, a typical homeschooling style, um, have you seen anything that's really connected you to one specific curriculum? I know like my kids have picked things up through Story of the World and or through five in a row and because my kids have made connections outside of our actual study time, it's made me go, that is it, that's a winner for our family. So I wanna know if there are other um, stories out there that you guys would be willing to share. So. Uh, our Charlotte Mason stories, now that I've rambled on for almost 10 minutes already, I'm sorry, they'll be quick. Uh, Jesse, last year, um, or this year, well, wait, what is it? It's 2020 now, so in 2019, um, Easter, we had been studying Chopin, um, you know, just in our homeschool, he was our composer. We weren't even doing that great of a job consistently doing a composer study, but we were just, we would open up the book once a week, I'd read them a little snippet about a song, and then I would play that song, and then I would just play the other pieces we had learned, you know, whenever we had time. If they were playing with puzzles, I'd put the music on. When they were doing their chores, I'd put the music on. So they had heard it, um, but Jesse's my guy with like a little tough exterior. Um, if he's frustrated or flustered while we're doing school, I don't know if anything's getting through, and oftentimes the beginning of our school day, he's frustrated because he doesn't like to stop what he's doing to come do school and that is also the time that we're doing our artist and composer and all that. So I didn't think he was picking much up and so we're at this Easter egg hunt at you know uh, I think my aunt's country club and he's looking around and everyone's getting eggs and he was looking and he saw this butterfly and he's just watching it and I was like, oh, that's a really pretty butterfly, like thinking, oh, my nature study is really like doing something here. And he was like, that reminds me of that waltz by Chopin. Like those are the exact words he used. And when we had been studying, I don't know, it's the minute waltz or the minute waltz, whatever, I don't know. Um, while we were studying that, one of the things I asked the kids to do was close their eyes and imagine what they saw. And they kind of all, threw out some funny little things like people dancing across Legos and a dog chasing his tail and things like that. And so it's just this, you know, that like fluttering or like jumpy thought that they were having about it. So he was watching, oh, it was two butterflies. He's watching these two butterflies go back and forth and he made that connection. There was no music playing. We, it was, you know, spring break. We hadn't been doing any school, but he was just like, that reminds me of Chopin, that waltz by Chopin. And that like, I mean, I think it knocked the breath right out of me. And I, 
that one thing confirmed that it was just the right, because I love that that is the thought he has when, you know, when he sees something, he connects it to this, the whole idea of, you know, composers and artists is to put these beautiful pieces in our, the hallways of our kids' minds so that it comes out in other settings. And so when that happened, I could have cried. I could cry now because it was just this big, like, breath of air, like, oh, this is, it's doing something. It's provoking thoughts. I might not know what the thoughts are, but I'm definitely seeing that there's something going on in there. And he, at that point, you know, was just in second grade. So I'm not asking him to, to um, you know, have this amazing response when we're in school, but, I, but just to see that, like, the things we're doing are already making those connections, that was amazing. Um, the next one that I have is Eli. He is my kindergartner. So he's just kind of been going through school with us for a while. And the situation we had with him, this year we are studying Henry Wadsworth Longfellow. And last year we did Robert Louis Stevenson. And um, we had recited, I had asked each of the kids to pick one poem that was their favorite last year. And then they would kind of work on that throughout the semester. But it, um, so for the kids, they picked... The Swing by Robert Louis Stevenson. And so I never got to the point where I had them recite the whole thing, but we read it a lot. And this year, I'm pointing over here because we were sitting right there on the floor by the couch. We were doing school one day and we were doing it here in the living room and we hadn't done our poet study with Henry Wadsworth Longfellow in a while. So I just said to the kids like, hey, okay, it's been a while since we've done this. Tell me a few things that you remember about his story or tell me a couple things about one of the poems and just to kind of break the ice before I introduced a new poem. And Bella said something and Jesse said something and Eli was really upset. And I was just like, it's okay, buddy, you're in kindergarten. I'm not expecting you to remember as much as your brother and sister. So just watch your brother and sister and know that one day you'll be able to answer those questions too. And he's like, oh, I just, I, I can't remember. He's like, all I can remember is the poem by Robert Louis Stevenson, he said the whole name, and, and I said, okay, well, do you want to tell me what you remember? And he recited the entire poem, The Swing, and it had been four or five months since I had even read that to them. So that was a moment of like, oh my gosh, this is sticking and you're only in kindergarten. So that was amazing. That was a great moment. Um, Annabeth, you know, she's two and a half, almost three. One of my favorite things about the method that the Charlotte Mason method and just the beauty it brings to our homeschool is that we do folk songs and hymn study and just seeing her hum those when she's playing with her little LOL dolls and um, hearing her sing the songs with the kids and just loving that part of school, that definitely confirms the method, you know, for multiple reasons. And then the last story is the most exciting one to me because it, it kind of connected a lot of things at once and that is Isabella's story. Um, she was reading, I'm gonna start this fresh. I could tell that my um, camera was about to run out of steam there. Um, so it just, it's the idea of reading living, living books. And I understand the point of that. I also disagree though on some of the idea of twaddle because for me, I would rather my kids read, and I just think it's, you know, in comparison to the times, I would rather my kids be reading anything than doing nothing. So if they're reading Dog Man, that's okay by me. Um, as long as they can also read the other text and that's more of what our curriculum is built on. But um, I had always st still wondered how just reading books would produce this full educational experience until Isabella was reading a book and it was set during, we hadn't gotten here in history yet. And I shared the story on Instagram, so some of you may know this already, but it was set during the um, westward expansion. I think it was like, you know, the prairie, set on the prairie. And she read something and she recognized that this one weed that was mistaken for a vegetable and it had caused deaths and, or it was mistaken for an herb or something um, was causing deaths. And then she picked up on that. She came running to me and she was like, mommy, I heard about this in another book. It was a book about the gold rush. 
and she said, and so-and-so's family in that book died from the same weed. And she's like naming, they, they made the same mistake. They thought it was, maybe they thought it was a parsnip. I don't remember, but she was so excited. Like, ba -da 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 -da. And at the end of, of realizing that she recognized this and that it, you know, it was making everyone sick in that book and also making everyone sick in that book, she made this connection, which I hadn't really made yet, to be honest with you, because of my broken up history, that the gold rush and the prairie and the Oregon Trail, that's what it was, the Oregon Trail, must not have been as disconnected or as far apart in her, you know, as she thought they were. And so she wanted to know if she could do more research. Like, can we find out if this is, if this was at the same time? Can we find out if these people are related? They're both fictional characters, so, you know, obviously we dealt with that, but can we find out if they know each other, if they knew each other? Can we find out, like, when this was and when that was and where this was and where that was? And she wanted to look at a map and she wanted to figure it all out. And so I let her and it turned into this whole big idea, like this whole big, um, you know, research thing for her of uh, trying to, based on, one word and or like one piece of a chapter in one book and a you know a larger portion of another book and she had made that connection and that turned into geography history it turned into um you know genealogy times working on our um timeline all it just tied all these things together science botany all these things together in the course of one week and i was just like oh i see now i see how just exposing them to these living books, reading stories to them, and allowing them to think. And you know, all this narration and dictation that you're asking them to do, even when you're not asking them, sometimes the kids will say, you didn't ask me, I wanna tell you. And I'm like, okay, tell me. But I never realized, like even when I'm not asking them to say things back to me, they're making all these connections in their mind because they're in the practice of picking up on things and retelling stories, and so, that was a big deal for me. So those are the things that have really um, solidified my commitment to this method that sometimes seems like, um, like, you know, you're just trusting the process and then sometimes you get a little bit of harvest from, all, from what you're sowing. Um, so I wanna know if you guys have any similar stories. And again, this was not to convince anybody of the Charlotte Mason method. I think if you try to fit your family into a mold versus trying to figure out what already works for you, it's not gonna be a, a hit. So I didn't wanna you know, try to make anybody believe in the method that we kind of subscribe to. But I just wanted to share that across the whole entire school year, I thought nothing was really happening. And then when you start to turn your eyes toward these smaller moments, you see what the bigger picture may look like as they get older or what's really going on in their minds. So share a story in the comments, please. Let me know if your kids have had a similar experience, something that has really made you trust the process of whatever, whatever method you're choosing or if it has made you really more enjoy a curriculum because you see your kids um, experiencing the real world um, through the eyes of something they've already learned. Let me know in the comments below if you guys have any of these moments um, and I will see you guys later. Thanks for listening. It was a really long video, longer than expected, but I was just really excited to share. So I'll talk to you guys later. Bye.